first. Yes, thank you. I was going to say, please record. Um, so uh, today the speaker is going to be Yan Feng Zhang. Uh, he is a research staff member at IBM Research AI. Uh, his research interests lie in the intersection of HCI and AI. Um, he received a BS in computer and information science from the University of Oregon in 2015 and a BS in Beijing Normal University uh, majoring in computer science. Um, his research projects focus on creating novel and effective AI explanations and bias mitigation algorithms, as well as investigating information designs that help people make better use of AI's, AI for decision tasks. Um, but today he's gonna to be talking about uh, a very, very interesting uh, topic of building trustworthy AI, uh, measuring and mitigating algorithmic biases. Uh, so with that, please, uh, please begin. Thank you, thank you, Keith, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Yeah, um, you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and um, hi everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. Um, like Keith said, I'm a, a member of the uh, Human AI Collaboration Team at IBM Research AI. Our team works on various algorithm and the system designs to enable humans to make better use of AI, mostly in terms of uh, making more judicious decisions. Uh, so in this talk, I want to primarily discuss our work on the subject of AI fairness. And uh, throughout this talk, feel free to uh, read questions and I'll try to answer them as best as I, I, I can. Um, okay. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about my past research. I, I got my PhD degree in computer science at the University of Oregon in 2015, and I joined the IBM research after that. Uh, my PhD research was on HCI, uh, so that's human computer interaction. And specifically, my research was on a very model-driven and quantitative approach to HCI called cognitive modeling. And in cognitive modeling, we develop these uh, computational models to simulate the various human information processes, uh, such as uh, memory, visual perception, and uh, motor control. And these simulations are largely uh, um, based on psychological theories, uh, like memory decay and Fitts law. Uh, so we were mostly interested in the timing aspect of these, these uh, information processes because we want to use these models to predict how long it takes for people to complete a task, uh, given a certain user interface. The main application of this kind of research is to be able to automate the usability testing so you no longer need to carry out costly human user studies. Um, uh, so my dissertation work was on modeling and predicting human multitasking and visual search behaviors. And for that, I did a lot of eye tracking experiments to see in detail how these behaviors, um, how the human behaviors unfold at a millisecond time scale. Um, so you can see my, uh, my past research was um, very different from what I do here at IBM. Um, however, uh, I'm, um, because of my interest in uh, HCI, uh, so uh, I, I study the intersection between HCI and AI, and that includes uh, AI fairness. Um, so at IBM, we have a large group of researchers working on these projects, um, including fairness, explainability, and the transparency. And we have taken a pretty comprehensive approach to making AI more trustworthy. You can see here that we have developed four uh, open source toolkits. You can uh, Google them and um, download them and try, try them out. Um, and these, these toolkits are to make AI more secure, fair, and um, transparent. And besides fairness, you might be interested in the AI explainability 360 toolkit. 
which includes numerous algorithms for explaining AI decisions. Um, but in this talk, I will introduce four of my research projects on AI fairness. And the first one is about the open source library, uh, the AI Fairness 360 toolkit we developed that includes uh, numerous fairness metrics and bias mitigation algorithms. And the second and third projects are about two bias mitigation algorithms that I developed and co-developed. And the last one uh, is about a user study we conducted on fairness. And if we have time, we can go through this one in detail. Otherwise, uh, probably just briefly talk about it. Um, yeah, so AI and more broadly data-driven decision systems have permeated our society today. Uh, AI has certainly created tremendous values for businesses and uh, other organizations, but like any other technologies, it is also a double-edged sword. Um, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with the Compass uh, case from ProPublica, um, but basically it showed that the software that many U.S. courts use in determining criminal recidivism risk is likely biased against uh, African Americans. And in the last uh, in the last few years, there were many other cases like like this that made line, made the headline. Um, for example. Amazon uh, had, had to abandon their AI-based hiring tool because it was found to discriminate against women. And also uh, researchers found that a very popular algorithm used in the healthcare system uh, was showing bias uh, against uh, uh, African-Americans because it was basically assigning lower health risk uh, to black patients. And that, means that uh, uh, it would allocate fewer uh, medical resources to black patients. So I think in the past, uh, the general public's perception of AI was that uh, it's emotionless, so it, it cannot be biased. But nowadays, people are very aware of this problem. Um, people know that it's not only the um, AI bias is not only possible, but probable if the data on which we train the models are biased. And um, because of this, partly because of this public attention to the AI bias issue, um, researchers and um, not only AI researchers uh, started to focus on uh, this problem. And there has been a lot of uh, publications in this domain in the last uh, six years or so. Um, and also there were also um, several open source projects that implemented various fairness metrics. Um, however, uh, at least in 2018, when we set out to develop our own open source toolkit, uh, there was a uh, Pretty, pretty much no library that put together both metrics and mitigation algorithms into an easily usable package. So that's why we developed AI Fairness 360. It was probably the industry's first comprehensive bias mitigation toolbox. It was open sourced from uh, the beginning and recently we donated it to the Linux Foundation. It supports both Python and R, and we included more than 30 fairness metrics in the package, plus more than 10 um, different bias mitigation algorithms. So we have since grown a very big community. There are about uh, a thousand people who joined our Slack channel. Uh, you're welcome to join too. And some of them uh, actually contributed the algorithm to the toolkit. Um, and yeah, so they are from outside of IBM. And so this is a team that put all this together um, for into this AI Fairness 360 toolkit. And uh, most of this team are also involved in uh, the development of other toolkits I mentioned earlier. And uh, here, Sachka is our director and Kush Varshini is our tech lead. Um, yeah. 
So now I want to talk a bit more about the metrics and algorithms we included in the package. So again, looking at this list, you might wonder why we have so many different fairness metrics. And part of the reason is that there isn't really a universally agreed upon notion of fairness. So even in the legal domain in the US, we have these two different doctrines, uh, disparate treatment and uh, uh, disparate impact. And sometimes they come into conflict with each other. There are also these different philosophical or political viewpoints about fairness, uh, such as equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Um, but in this talk, I mostly want to discuss uh, statistical fairness criteria, which roughly map to some of these philosophical notions of fairness. So in their book, Fairness and Machine Learning, um, Salam Barokas, Morris Hart, and Arvind Narayanan defined three representative fairness criteria. Um, these are independence, uh, separation, and sufficiency. So independence requires that a model's prediction uh, to be statistically independent from an individual's protected attribute. So roughly speaking, this means that the model should produce equal acceptance rate for different groups uh, if it's a binary classification task. And this notion of uh, independence roughly maps to the uh, notion of uh, equality of outcome and also this uh, uh, legal notion of uh, uh, disparate uh, impact. The separation is more about equalizing accuracy across groups. And similarly, sufficiency also have that uh, effect. Um, so sufficiency is about uh, equalizing calibration across groups. And calibration measures the deviance of the model's predicted probability from the true probability. And so visually speaking, that means we want to, uh, we, we want these two calibration curves to be as close as possible. And um, if they are close to the diagonal line, that's even better. That basically means they have uh, a very good calibration. Um, and so given these different uh, statistical fairness criteria, they can be mapped into uh, different uh, metrics. And so for independence, we can measure the difference between two groups acceptance rate. Um, so that would be called statistical parity difference. Um, otherwise, we can also measure the ratio between uh, the two groups acceptance rates. And for separation, um, because we try to make sure the group is uh, equally accurate uh, across groups, we can measure it uh, in many different ways because the machine learning, you, uh, there are many different metrics to measure accuracy. And often uh, it depends on, so which metric to choose here depends on your application. Sometimes uh, you care more about uh, the, the true positive rate of your application. And sometimes you care more about the false positive rate. So uh, depending on which metric you, uh, which accuracy metric you care more about, you would measure the difference uh, in that metric uh, across groups and to make sure that that metric would be uh, kind of equally uh, uh, distributed. Um, you can also take um, a weighted approach uh, of these different metrics. And for sufficiency, we can measure the expected calibration error and the, or the difference in expected calibration error uh, across groups. Or you can also measure the difference in, uh, I think, like, uh, AUC, uh, error under curve um, for ROC curves. And so besides these three major categories of metrics, uh, we can also measure, uh, the, there are other uh, fairness criteria like individual fairness. And in our toolkit, we have a, a metric called the generalized entropy index. And this one is interesting because it actually can, can be broken down into individual fairness and group fairness metrics. 
And it's actually borrowed from the uh, economics field um, to measure uh, income inequality. And so, yeah, again, since we have so many different metrics, it will be, um, it's, a, it's a question as to which one to select. Uh, earlier I mentioned for separation, uh, you can choose the metric based on which accuracy metric you mostly care about. Um, but at a higher level, um, I think if you believe that there is no causal reason for the, uh, for the base rates to be different across groups, uh, you would pick a metric under this independence category uh, to make sure the basically the acceptance rates are, are the same or similar uh, across groups. Um, if you believe there is some reason to, um, to believe that the, the base rates are, could be reasonably different, um, then measuring the accuracy, the separation or uh, calibration error would be more appropriate. Um, yeah, also more recently, there are research showing that there are problems with the, some of these metrics like uh, a difference in false positive rate. Um, basically, this is, if we, if we just measure this uh, error rate difference, it's not a very reliable measure. Sometimes you get a large difference, but that doesn't mean the model is treating different groups differently. It's really just the, uh, the dif distribution, um, the, uh, the error distribution is different uh, across groups. And even, so when that happens, even you have used the same classification threshold across groups, you still end up with different uh, false positive rates or true positive rates. And so, um, there, there are still, uh, the, the research on this is still evolving. And uh, I think we're still trying to find a better measure uh, to, uh, to, to measure um, accuracy difference. Uh, so yeah, that's about it on fairness metrics. I wonder if there, uh, there, if there are any questions. Uh, there's oh. one question from Christina, yes, you were seeing. Yeah, okay, separation is a balance condition. Uh, can you elaborate on that question? Well, this is from the Kleinberg um, and Mulnathan paper. The mm -hmm. balance condition for the positive classes is conditioned on outcomes. The predictions should be the same for the, which I think translates basically this is more broadly the separation condition, the way I understood it. Yeah, uh, and then condition down the outcome. Yes, yes. yeah, and it, it show, is. And then they show incompatibility that you cannot jointly satisfy the, I guess, the balance condition and the calibration conditions. So the same thing applies, I guess, to all the separation and sufficiency conditions in under your. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, later I will. Uh, yeah, mention this uh, incompatibility problem. Yeah. Okay, but I have not seen yet this uh, this terminology, so I want to make sure that the balance conditions actually map to separation. So thanks for presenting. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah, next I want to talk about uh, some bias mitigation strategies. Um, uh, roughly speaking, there are uh, these five different uh, categories of uh, mitigation strategies. Uh, the first one is fairness through unawareness, which means that we exclude uh, protected attributes from our model. This is often required by law for certain domains like uh, employment and housing um, under this uh, disparate treatment uh, legal doctrine. However, uh, many researchers have argued against uh, this approach because one, when there is a large set of features, uh, particular attributes are usually co correlated with other features. So removing them is not helpful. For instance, 
the practice of redlining prior to 1970s um, doesn't use race directly to discriminate against the minorities. Instead, they, uh, the mortgage lenders just used a, a very strongly correlated attribute zip code to deny minorities of their loan applications. Um, so that's one reason. The second reason is that uh, these particular attributes are often useful for removing biases. So consider the same mortgage loan lending case. Uh, living in certain low income neighborhoods might be a strong indicator for, uh, for loan default for maybe for white Americans, but it could be a poor indicator for black Americans for historical reason, um, perhaps um, black Americans are more likely to uh, live in low income neighborhood even when they have sufficient income like, just to live close to their family. Right? So it's reasonable to believe there is some interaction between uh, race and uh, zip code. So in this case, if we uh, include the race variable, uh, that will actually help the model learn the, this interaction term and thus it would make the model fair, uh, fairer. So all in all, I, I would not recommend this first um, bias mitigation strategy unless it's required by law. And the second and probably the go-to strategy we should consider is to, uh, to collect better data or take a better data collection uh, strategy because we know the main source of AI bias is uh, data bias. And so we need to carefully examine our data for potential labeling bias and our data collection method for sampling bias. And one recent uh, survey conducted by um, Hosten et al. has indicated that this, um, the practitioners of machine learning uh, know this. They, they although the, uh, our, as AI researchers, we just try to uh, invent new algorithms um, these practitioners know that the data is the main problem and they, what they need is some kind of uh, scaffolding or tooling support for fairness aware data collection and uh, uh, tested uh, design. Um, but so far, there hasn't been much research on this subject. And uh, the rest of this list are about uh, bias mitigation algorithms. Uh, they map to the three different categories in uh, AI, AI Fairness 360 uh, called pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing algorithms. With pre-processing algorithms, we aim to statistically transform the existing data to make them fairer before using them to train models. With in-processing, our goal is to train bias-free classifiers directly. And with post-processing, we transform the predictions of the model to make them fairer. So here's a list of some of these algorithms we, we in, in, in implemented in each category in AIF 360. Without going into the details, I just want to briefly describe a few algorithms to give you a flavor of how they work in principle. The, the reweighing algorithm tries to enforce independence through weights. Uh, so we, we know in probability theory, uh, events that are events are independent when their joint probability is equal to the product of uh, the probability of each event. So if we apply this to fairness, we want the same thing. We want the joint probability of uh, acceptance rate in a specific group to be the same as a product of their separate probabilities. Uh, of course, it's un unlikely for a given data set, but if we assign weights like this, uh, basically we divide the, uh, the, the product of the probability by the joint probability, then effectively we, uh, we, are, we are achieving this equality. And so, in my experience, this algorithm actually works pretty effective, uh, effectively. And it's also easy to understand. It doesn't require much computational power. Uh, so this is often my go-to method when trying out uh, the uh, bias mitigation. 
And another pre-processing method is uh, this learn, learn fair representation method. This one tries to map the input data uh, X into a set of prototypes Z within X. And we want this mapping to satisfy uh, this equation here. So that's, which basically is saying the probability of mapping some data from the, uh, one, uh, like the privileged group into uh, one prototype is the same as the uh, probability of mapping similar data from the uh, unprivileged group to the same prototype. So um, after, after doing this transformation, uh, we are basically learning a mapping that, uh, that, that retains the previous information in X except the protected attributes. Um, so in the in the in processing category, the prejudice remover algorithm adds a regularizer regularizer term to logistic re regression to capture bias as loss. So that's the uh, regularizer term that the algorithm adds, and many other algorithm kind of works like this. They all try to capture um, bias um, using this uh, regular regularization terms. And so when you do uh, loss fun minimization, this uh, um, bias will be minimized. And another popular approach is adverse serial debiasing. Um, so this follows the, the adverse serial training approach invented for generative neural networks. And so here we have the usual predictor that this, this a uh, typical predictor that tries to predict the true outcome. Um, but in addition to that, we also have an adversary network that tries to predict the predicted attribute based on the output layer of the predictor. Uh, so, so yeah, um, because these two, two networks, they work against each other, eventually the predictor will learn how to correctly classify uh, the data without relying on uh, in, uh, information from the, the predicted attribute because it wants to prevent the adversary uh, to predict um, the, uh, the predicted attribute. So one thing to note is that for these uh, um, in-processing algorithms, uh, they limit your choices of uh, classifiers. So prejudice remover can only apply to logistic regression, while adversarial debiasing only applies to neural nets. And so typically this approach is hard to take in a, in a practical scenario. And I think in, in practice, what works more effectively is um, these uh, post-processing algorithms because they don't really change your training data um, or your existing classification pipelines. Um, and so it, it only works on the, the predictions of the, uh, your classifiers. So in this category, a very popular approach is called uh, equalized odds post-processing. And this method tries to adjust the thresholds of the uh, classifier, the classification thresholds uh, for, for different groups. So basically where we can set a different threshold for uh, a different demographic group. And this algorithm will try to find the threshold settings that satisfy equalized odds or equalized uh, opportunity criterion. So equalized opportunity criterion uh, is, uh, requires the classifier to have the equal true positive rates uh, across groups, whereas equalized odds criterion requires the classifier to have both equal true positive rates and equal false positive rates. So visually speaking, uh, let's say we have uh, these two ROC curves for, uh, for two groups. And basically we're trying to find a point on these ROC curves that 
uh, that will have the same true positive rates and false positive rates for uh, different groups. So naturally, the intersection of the two curves satisfy that. Um, and if we're talking about equalized opportunity criterion, we're basically trying to find the, uh, the intersection between these curves and uh, any horizontal lines, because if we draw a horizontal line, these intersections will have uh, uh, the same true positive rates. And so basically, yeah, this algorithm will help us find these intersection points. Um, okay, so that's a brief look of some of these algorithms we've included in AIF360. Most of them uh, were in fact invented outside of IBM and the authors often provide some reference implementations. So what we have done is to put all of these algorithms together and provide a unified programming interface to, the, to them. Um, so you can see this is a UML diagram of the class interface we implemented. We also uh, maintained the compatibility to this popular machine learning library called scikit-learn. You can see we have these fit, predict, and transform methods. Uh, so it's easy to use these algorithms into uh, in your existing um, code. So this is uh, the website for our toolkit. Uh, you're welcome to take a look. There's also a, a web demo showing the effects of uh, um, the different bias mitigation algorithms and how to apply the different uh, um, bias metrics. Um, so yeah, that's about the toolkit. Um, let me see if there are questions here. Okay. Uh, so I could explain this in a little more detail the, mm -hmm. the, so you understand. Um, what I mean here is um, there was a paper that found that if we, uh, you know, between the two choices of just leaving the um, compass predictions as is, which is sort of in some sense balanced, and other methods to <clears throat> ensure equal odds uh, post-processing. Uh, they're mentioning how, in some sense, the equal odds post-processing is not necessarily fair because you're creating different thresholds for different uh, races. For compass data, let's say there's a risk score mm -hmm. and you'd be giving uh, a different risk score uh, for which, which would suggest whether someone should uh, receive bail or not, you'd be given a different risk score for people who are black than for people who are white. Yeah. While in some sense, with I mean, strictly speaking, statistically, that's fine. But from a, say, maybe criminal justice or, I don't know, philosophical point of view, uh, maybe it would not be fair in that sense. And yeah. I'm wondering if, in general, that might be a, a critique of these equalized post-processing methods. Well, yeah, it really depends on uh, what kind of uh, um, fairness definition are we, uh, are we trying to uphold. Um, I think when we say these are unfair, it's mostly because we like want to, when we're taking this uh, disparate treat, treatment uh, doctrine. Like basically we want to set the same threshold for uh, different groups. Um, otherwise, yeah, if we're setting different thresholds, in a way it sounds like we're, like we're basically treating different groups uh, uh, differently, right? Um, so that could be conceived as unfair, unfair um, if we take this uh, disparate uh, treatment point of view. Um, but yeah, this one is really, really, this algorithm is approaching the fairness problem from, uh, I guess, from the, the disparate impact view. It's trying to make sure the model is equally accurate uh, across group, groups. But mm -hmm. that means, Basically, what that it means, it, it has to bring down the accuracy for uh, the um, majority group. I guess in the compass case, it's 
uh, it will have to reduce accuracy for for the uh, for for white in order to satisfy this uh, equal equalized odds criterion. That's but uh, yeah, sometimes that's really not the best uh, approach to do it. Um, again, I think in a practical scenario, the first thing we should try is to uh, to uh, to to collect the better data. And sometimes you, just by collecting better data, you can improve the accuracy, the classifier's accuracy uh, for the minority group. Uh, uh, yeah, in the case of compass, I think it's maybe because over policing basically caused the oversampling of the uh, uh, of the minority group. Uh, that could, yeah, that basically led to a uh, data problem, right? Um, and also, sometimes if you just use a higher, a more complex classifier, which has higher capacity, it can actually improve fairness. Um, because if you use a very simple uh, classifier like a, a logistic regression, uh, it, sometimes it, it exacerbates the uh, bias problem. Uh, this is related to the, this, uh, bias variance trade-off problem in machine learning. When yeah, when you have a, a a complex model, it can adapt to the variance in the data better and has fewer bias. Um, so that's why uh, sometimes using a more complex models would also uh, achieve better results. I see. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, so next, uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, uh, two bias mitigation algorithms. Um, and these were published at uh, AIES last year. And so the first one is about jointly optimizing AI fairness and uh, model utility. And this is related to what uh, Keith uh, asked her earlier. Um, yeah, basically when people uh, yeah, we know we have these uh, different uh, fairness criteria, um, but we also know that they are really not at all compatible, and it has been shown by many researchers now. Um, and without giving a formal proof, I just want to show an example. So if we optimize our classifier using that uh, uh, that equalize odds post-processing algorithm. And uh, let's say we have these four different curves representing uh, different races. And this is a model for a long risk assessment model. And if we optimize the model for a different uh, fairness objective, we end up with these different uh, versions of the model. They all have uh, like different threshold settings. And so, as you can see, there really isn't a, a, a setting or threshold setting that can satisfy uh, all the different uh, fairness criteria. So that means stakeholders need to make a trade-off um, between these fairness objectives. They, yeah, they need to say which kind of, which fairness objective is more important to them. And so our, uh, so we ask the, this question, how can stakeholders find the version of the model that meets their desired trade-off preference? So we proposed a, a, a three-step process to address this problem. And we, our approach is human-centered because um, we really need to help the stakeholders uh, understand that there is trade-off and also we need to elicit their uh, preference uh, in, in this uh, policy space. So, yeah, so, so the first step of this process is that uh, we want to help stakeholders see the possible trade-off configurations there. So in our paper, we considered um, balancing the model utility objective with two fairness objectives. Uh, the, the, these fairness objectives are uh, statistical, statistical parity difference, uh, which measures uh, that independence criterion. 
and also a weighted average odds difference, which measures uh, uh, separation. And I'll, yeah, I, I can show, yeah, I'll show the uh, equations later. Um, but uh, yeah, so we need to generate this space first. And here we take the approach similar to the equalized odds post-processing approach. Um, we basically set different thresholds for different groups. Um, but instead of just choosing the, the optimal settings, um, we actually just randomly sample different threshold settings for uh, different groups. And then we visualize the metrics measured from these different versions of the model. So as you can see, uh, for the first three graphs here, the X and the Y axis are the threshold settings. And so for each pair of threshold setting, we get a model and then we measure these uh, uh, metrics that we uh, care about. And so the, these are the metrics. So the utility is measured uh, by multiplying the benefits we get from those true or the correct predictions minus the cost of those uh, incorrect predictions. And uh, the statistical parity difference is basically the difference in uh, acceptance rates across the, the disadvantaged group and the advantaged group. And the last one, uh, the last one is actually a new metric we proposed in this paper. Uh, so normally when we measure separation, we measure average odds difference. And that is the average of uh, um, difference in false positive rates and true positive rates. But in a, in a practical application, you often have uh, different costs. Uh, so, so sometimes you have a very large cost for a false positive error. Uh, compared to the benefit you get from true positive uh, uh, correction, uh, true, true positive prediction. So, so we need to take care uh, to take into account these uh, different uh, costs and uh, benefit uh, assignments. And so that's why we use them to weight these, uh, these uh, uh, differences. And so given these three metrics here, we are basically uh, trying to visualize the model's performance across them. And the, the last graph is the, the one that's most useful because uh, for our stakeholders, for, the, for our stakeholders, if they want a model that's perfectly accurate, they, would, they will try to find the model that's uh, uh, close to the origin point. Um, because that's where the SPD and both SPD and WLD are zero. But they can easily see from this graph, the models near this point has negative utility. So if it's a long risk assessment model, basically the business is not viable. Um, so they would pick, they would try to pick models from this high utility region, which has a yellowish color. Um, but if they look at this graph, they also see like what kind of uh, uh, fairness uh, um, metrics they, they kind of need to sacrifice. So with these visualizations, um, the stakeholders can more easily understand the, the trade-off that's imp imp implied by their uh, decisions. So then the next step is to elicit from the stakeholders their relative weights on these different objectives. And so here we use um, a, a method called analytical hierarchy process. This, is, this method is uh, found from the multi-criteria decision anal analysis literature. And so with this method, we basically ask the user, excuse me, we ask them to complete uh, pairwise comparisons among uh, the different objectives. So uh, that is the users need to compare utility versus separation, separation versus independence, and the utility versus independence. And then with each comparison, the user indicates which criterion is more important and how much more important on the nine point scale. 
And then we can use the, these ratings and their reciprocals to construct a three by three matrix and then use the largest eigenvalues of this matrix as the weights for the uh, different objectives. This way, the weights we obtained are much more robust than the weights uh, obtained by other methods like direct elicitation, uh, where you basically ask the user to assign some uh, numeric value directly to each objective. So now with the weights uh, elicited, we can combine the different objectives into a single objective function and then try to find threshold settings that minimize this function. So this function is not uh, convex and it doesn't have a, a smooth gradients. And so we, we could not use regular uh, optimization methods. Instead, we used a, a Bayesian uh, hyperparameter optimization method uh, to, to minimize this function. And so this table lists some of our results uh, using this uh, optimization method for the German credit data set. And as you can see, it's very effective because if we choose to maximize utility by setting uh, the utility rating to nine, um, we find a model that indeed gives us very high utility. But if we want to minimize uh, SPD or WAOD, we do success, successfully find the models that have zero SPD and zero WAOD. And similarly, if we want to take a, a we want to have a balanced uh, objective here, we're saying we want to treat utility and uh, SPD uh, equally uh, important, uh, with equal importance then what, what we find is a model with pretty high utility and also close to zero SPD uh, while the um, WAOD is still quite high. So you can see it's, it is very effective. Um, so here's a link to a live demo of the system. Uh, I will not go through it now, but you, you can try it out. Um, and uh, we can also discuss it on our one-on-one uh, -on -one session le uh, later. Um, okay, let me see if there, yeah, okay. Um, since I, I think I only have 10 minutes left, I, I guess I would just talk, uh, uh, talk about this one more algorithm and I'll probably just briefly uh, talk about the user study we have done. Um, yeah, so the, um, this is another bias mitigation method. Um, and it, it's, it, it does mitigation through data augmentation. And this one is also published at the AIS last year. So here we started from a very simple idea. We know that the, our data uh, is, the data bias is main source of bias. And so, we often lack data from uh, the protected uh, classes. And so to alleviate this issue, it's possible just to, uh, to maybe to create some synthetic training data points. And that way we can uh, like complete our uh, training data set. Uh, so to give a concrete example, Let's say we have this original data set. Um, this one is very biased because it, the mod, uh, we're only given positive de uh, decision to male accountants and female nurses and male professors. So there is very high correlation between gender and uh, uh, occupation. Um, in order to Reduce to neutralize that bias, we could create a, a set of synthetic data points, which where we basically keep all the attributes the same except the gender attribute. So we just flip the gender attribute to uh, uh, to a different uh, uh, value. This this approach is very similar to auditing or how uh, to how auditing is done. 
uh, and typically people generate uh, many different profiles and uh, they keep the, all the other information the same except the, the protected attribute. And so if we can use this kind of data set to train the model, the model should be uh, at least robust to, to that kind of uh, uh, bias. Um, however, there, there of course are problems. One is that uh, um, these are, this method is introducing unrealistic data points. Uh, so that could uh, uh, reduce our classifier's accuracy. Um, and so to mitigate this issue, we came up with a data realism score to measure how much the synthetic data points deviate from the original distribution. And to calculate this score, we first uh, applied k-mean clustering on the original data set, and then measured the distance of a synthetic data point to each cluster center. And then we take the inverse of the maximum uh, distance as the realism score. And then we sort our synthetic data points based on that realism score. So users can choose to only use the the somewhat realistic synthetic data points to limit the uh, impact of these uh, data points on model accuracy. And then we so apply this algorithm to several benchmark data sets. Here I'm showing results for the adult income data set on the left and for the compass data set on the right. So we, we know the adult income data set has gender bias and the compass data set has ratio bias. The x-axis here shows the percentage of the synthetic data points we're adding. So it's from 0% all the way to 100%. Again, as the percentage goes up, we're basically adding uh, less and less realistic data points. Uh, the good news is that you can see it, um, even if we add 100% data point, uh, synthetic data points, we're not really reducing accuracy by that much. Uh, however, for the adult income data set, you could see that the, it, it really leads to better um, fairness metrics. So the green line shows the average odds difference and the red line shows the statistical parity difference. And you can see as we add more synthetic data points, these uh, uh, metrics, they all go up and approach uh, zero, which is the, like the uh, perfect, perfectly fair point. Um, however, for the compass data set, this uh, method didn't really help. You can see the curves, uh, the, the two curves are still oscillating uh, around negative 0.25. And so we thought about why uh, the, there is such a difference between the two different uh, two data sets. And we believe it's because for the this adult income data set, their uh, gender had some impact in terms of uh, predicting the income. But for the compass data set, race uh, actually didn't play an important role in the in our predictor. And so, however, that doesn't mean the, the model isn't biased just because it's race is not uh, having an effect because we can see from these metrics, it's still, uh, it's still quite high, bias is still quite high. And so this could be because uh, there's some correlation um, between, the, uh, between race and uh, uh, other variables like the uh, number of priors like just due to over policing, um, there uh, uh, black people might have much higher number of uh, priors, and that that uh, number of priors is a very significant attribute in our uh, in our predictor. So, if we want to correct this kind of bias, we have to be more uh, aggressive in our. Uh, in our selection of the synthetic data points. Um, because so far, when we add the synthetic data points, 
we didn't really care whether the data points would have favorable or unfavorable impact to the protected group. Um, so for, for instance, suppose we have some uh, original instance where um, we have white defendants who recommit crimes. Our method would actually add a synthetic instance in which uh, black defendants recommit crimes. So obviously these in instances don't really help us mitigate biases uh, if we know that's the directional bias we want to mitigate. So one thing we could do is to filter out these unhelpful synthetic, uh, synthetic data points. Uh, that is, we choose to only add favorable synthetic data for the unprivileged group and um, unfavorable synthetic data for the privileged group. And so here we show the results after using this Grady selection approach. And you can see um, after taking this approach, even after just adding 50% of the synthetic data points, uh, the bias is basically at zero. Um, and we compared our method with uh, some existing methods like uh, reweighing, uh, adversarial debiasing, and I think this is optimal pre-processing or, or optimized pre-processing. Um, our method actually had uh, um, very little impact on accuracy compared to these algorithms, these other algorithms. And also it had um, sometimes even yeah, better um, effect on, on reducing biases. Um, also, another advantage of our method is that it's arguably easier to understand, especially for lay people who are unfamiliar with uh, uh, machine learning, uh, because we're just adding synthetic data points. Um, and people, we also give people some control over how much uh, um, bias reduction they want to they want to want to do. Um, by basically controlling the percentage of synthetic data points to add. Um, yeah, okay, so the last one, uh, just very briefly, it's a user study we have done where we want to know um, the, uh, how- I, I, Sorry to interrupt very briefly. I, I just wanted to warn you that it is uh, noon yeah. our time. So it, you, you might need to end fairly soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just one, yeah, one sentence here. It's about um, uh, looking at how to explain model decisions um, in order for people to, to understand the uh, model fairness problems. What we found is basically uh, that among all these style, different styles of uh, explanations, this uh, sensitivity or counterfactual explanation style is most effective. And basically that means if we say things like, if the person had been Caucasian, she would have been predicted as not likely to re-offend. So something like this, if that kind of explanation is involved, people can immediately see there is a uh, bias problem in the model. Otherwise, if you just explain that the model uh, traits uh, is has, uh, using the race, somewhat or um, there are similar cases to this person if you use these kind of uh, explanations uh, people are were generally not very sensitive to um, bias issues in the model yeah so that pretty much summarized uh, the results and yeah thank you for the yeah thank you for your time and for this opportunity to talk about our research this was a great talk and thank you again for uh, uh, introducing us to this uh, Fairness 360 toolkit. Um, I think we have time for one question. Does anyone have a question? Um, I have a question I'll share for our one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Uh, but, but I guess one thing I wanted to ask was uh, you were looking at deviations from the maximum of clusters. Uh, presumably this would be uh, a few slides back. Um, yeah. Uh, in order to find that the the, the um, what is it called the realism score. Yeah. Um, the 
one question I would have is, I would assume this is only for tabulated data, right? So if you have high dimensional data, is there some equivalent that one could construct? Oh, oh okay. Um, but like, like images or, or text. Right. Uh, yeah, this is for mostly for tabular data. We haven't thought about for uh, high dimensional data. Um, yeah, for high dimensional data, I guess, yeah, clustering could be a problem. But if you use uh, like regular k mean clustering and just take the regular Euclidean distance, it should still just give you the number of clusters you want. Um, and if you use the uh, like uh, uh, encodings from from a typical NLP model like uh, transformers, I think their their encoding the um, the the embeddings are um, uh, can you you can I think you can apply Euclidean distance metrics to these encodings uh, since they are typically used as input to uh, uh, to a linear classifier like a, um, uh, a linear perceptron so probably it still works although we, yeah we have haven't used it like that that's a good point um I was actually uh, I've been doing some work on on using distances with uh with specifically transformer embeddings. And uh, based on a discussion I had with a master's student, he brought up a very good point that there was this paper back in 2000 on high dimensional data such as embeddings mm -hmm. might be benefiting from using a distance metric like Manhattan distance oh, or okay. even a, a distance metric that's slightly different from that. Okay. Because the, the issue is with Euclidean distance, when dimensions are too high, the difference between the largest distance and the smallest distance uh, is 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 relatively small. Like there's not much of a difference between the the range of distances uh -huh. uh, because everything seems to be roughly very close to one another. Um, versus with Manhattan distance or even other sort of variants of that, it allows for a larger spread and a more uh, maybe a more appropriate way to determine how far things are from one another. Okay, uh, but but that's a small small point. Um, I think it's another thing that we could talk about later. Even mm -hmm. determining how to switch gender with tabulated data, it's obviously as simple as changing a label. But with images or with text, it might be much more complicated, um, especially with images where you maybe have to do some sort of GAN-based method to change the gender of face, for example. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah that, that's stuff we could discuss later. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Um, uh, I think since it is already past noon uh, and, and assuming that people don't have any other questions, um, I want to thank you again for this really excellent talk. Uh, oh, many you. of us here are interested in, in fairness, and myself included, as you can probably tell. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be very excited to talk to you this afternoon. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm very excited uh, to talk to you too.